Many be seated, church. By the way, I don't know if you noticed or not, but Justin's not here today. It's good for him to take some time off and to, to travel and, and whatnot. Um, but uh, where'd Jackson go? Jackson, thank you, brother, for leading today. Yeah, man. Way to go. I don't think he likes a lot of attention, so he's like, thanks a lot, man, but uh, grateful for you, brother. Thank you for doing that today and for our worship team. Guys, today's a good day to be here as we start a new series. Uh, as a church, we love to walk um, through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so we don't miss what God has for us. And today we start a new series in the book of Colossians. Hopefully Colossians sounds familiar to you because that's what we're walking through in our reading plan in, our, in your homes, but uh, that doesn't normally happen. In fact, I don't think that's ever happened, but it's not a bad thing that we're reading through at home what we're preaching through at church. Um, but Lord willing, as a church, we'll be in this series in Colossians for about 10 weeks, maybe 11 weeks, depend how much I talk. Amen, right? But uh, so I'm excited to preach through this and see how the Lord's going to use this in our lives and in our church. As Christ followers, we are called to grow and mature in our walk with Jesus. In fact, Scripture actually warns us and encourages us. He says, don't stay as babies, right? Don't stay as kindergartners or first graders in the faith, right? But grow, mature in our walk with Christ. And so as we look at what it looks like to walk with Jesus and to grow in our walk with Jesus, as we continue to learn from him and follow him, Colossians is a great book uh, for us to walk through and study together. Today, we're going to do a little history lesson. We're going to introduce uh, this letter of Colossians and get some good background information and see what's going on. And then we'll also see what God has for us uh, today in the first few verses. We're going to see who God used to write this letter. We'll see why it was written and who it was written to. And we're definitely going to see what we can learn and apply to our lives. And so we'll have a little bit of introduction. And then uh, I'm looking forward to looking at just the first two uh, verses, and that's going to be our main focus for today. So if you do have your Bibles, Colossians is we're going to be at today. If you need a Bible, there's some in the back, and if you need one to take home with you, that's our gift to you. Church, when we're reading through the Bible individually, or maybe as a church, when we start a new book of the Bible, one of the temptations there is, is to either overlook the first two or the first few verses, or just to read through the introduction real quick. But church, no matter what book of the Bible you're reading, I would encourage you to spend time in the introduction, right? Because God has it there for a reason, right? And today we're going to see in Paul's greeting how he greets these Christians in this church, and he's going to remind us, he's going to remind them and remind us who we are. Paul opens this letter to the church with a, a greeting, but I think there's a lot packed into that greeting that I don't want us to miss. And so based on what we see in verses 1 and 2 today, we're going to talk a lot about who we are. We're going to talk about our identity. Because who we are, church, who you are, determines how we live our lives. Who you are det determines how we see and live in the world around us. And so before we get into really the meat of Colossians, before we even get to verse 3, we're going to begin by focusing on who we are as Christians, as Christ followers. And so church, we are going to do a bit of introduction, but I want us to, to read this passage, to seek God in prayer, and then we're going to dive into that. So to honor God's reading, would you guys stand with me? Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to read the first two verses that we'll pray and then we'll dive in. Here's what God's word says. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints, that's who he's writing to, and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. God, we come to you. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us. We thank you for the word of God that we can dive into and hear from you. We can trust you. God, there's a a lot of information going around in the world today and it's ever changing, but your word is always true in every season, in every culture. Doesn't matter who's president, doesn't matter what time of year it is, doesn't matter what year it is. The word of God is always true and we can trust you. And so God, we come to you today. Would you teach us? Would you help us focus on you, God? And we pray, Lord, that, that we would respond to what you're teaching us today. I, I, I feel, God, every time we open the word of God, we should respond. And so, Father, would you help us do that today? We love you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
So let's talk a little bit about who God used to write this letter, why he wrote it, and who he wrote it to. So the, the, the writer of Colossians is, is pretty easy to see in, in Colossians. It's not really disputed. Sometimes you'll have books of the Bible where the author is disputed or discussed and say, I think it's this person, I think it's this person, but this one's pretty clear. Verse 1 begins by saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother. And so Paul is, is the writer, and he identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus. So there were many churches that Paul started, right? God used Paul to be a church planter and start a whole lot of churches. And those churches would know Paul really well. Right? If you've ever planted a church, started a church, you get to know that church really well, right? But Paul didn't plant this church. A man named Epaphras did. By the way, if you've got a child coming, there's a name for you, Epaphras. Let's, let's... This, na- or this, this man was probably saved in Ephesus uh, while Paul was ministering to the church there. And after he was saved, God sent, him, uh, sent Epaphras back to Colossae to start this church. And so this church probably knew who Paul was. Right? But they didn't really know him personally. He had not been there. He had not, uh, didn't start the church. And so he introduces himself in verse 1. And we see that he's accompanied by, by Timothy. We know Timothy is, is a man that he cared for deeply. He actually says Timothy is a son in the faith. Right, You are my true son in the faith. By the way, this is a great encouragement. Not everybody in here has kids. right? But if you know Christ, man, you should be pouring into somebody. Right? And so that's what's happening. Paul is pouring into Timothy and teaching him and training him, but he's also serving with him. I love that church. He is his co-laborer in ministry. And so historians have placed this letter to be written somewhere around 60 to 62 AD. And during that time frame, Paul would have actually been in prison in Rome when he wrote this, when he wrote this letter. And I think it's important to, to point that out, church, because it reminds us Sometimes we get in situations where we just we really don't think about God using us God can use us no matter where we are church Right Paul was in prison in Rome But God is using him to write and to encourage these Christians in another city He's using Paul and Paul is saying God use me Right doesn't matter what situation we're in God can 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 use you The city of Colossae was once a thriving city uh, today, if you were to go to where this is, it's located in the modern day Turkey. There's not a whole lot to see there right now, right? I've had some friends that visit there. They've shared some pictures. You can just basically look it up online, but it's basically a field, a field and a hill, right? There's not a lot going on there. But at one point, Colossae was a thriving city. They were located right in the middle of major travel routes. So if you lived anywhere in that area and you needed to go north or south, east or west, you're going through Colossae. And so that gave a lot of people coming through, it gave them a lot of influence. They they also made a lot of money as people were traveling through there because they would trade wool as people came through, they would would trade wool. But a couple things happened in Colossae. Um, By the time Paul writes this letter, they're no longer a thriving city. They had a major earthquake that had gone through there, caused a lot of damage. And so because of that and other things that happened in that city, the trading routes changed. And so not a lot of people were traveling through there. But again, I think it's important for us to know because these people, this church, right, they were thriving and now they're not, but this church still mattered to Paul. They still mattered to the Lord. You know, one of the things that just hits me when we're traveling and we go through small towns, right, and you could tell, right, if you're you're old enough, you kind of remember Route 66, right, and it's still out there, but right, there's those towns really aren't thriving anymore, right? They, 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 they've got highways going through now. Not, not a lot of people are driving through there. But you see these churches, and then you see a church. And I, I say churches. When you drive through these cities that used to be thriving, and you just see these churches there. One of the things I love to do when we're driving through those, those small towns is, God, would you use that church for your glory? Would you use that church? These people matter, right? This town matters. Paul is saying when he writes this letter that you matter, church. You matter to the Lord. A lot of letters we read in the New Testament are written to bigger and influential cities. Why? Because it's shared there in the cities and then it spreads out of there. Colossians is probably the least influential uh, city but Paul, that he writes to, but Paul knew they needed to hear from him and to be encouraged. One of the reasons this church needed to hear from Paul, one of the reasons, because they were still pretty young. 
right? This church was about seven years old at this time. And so you had a lot of young new Christians, right? You had a lot of young in the faith Christians at this church. But Paul also needed to write to them because of a very serious issue. There was a, a threat. There was a false teaching uh, that was growing in the city. There was a false teaching that, that was dangerous. It really aimed to downplay who Jesus is. A lot of historians believe that the false teaching was Gnosticism. Right? There were many different ideas and beliefs within Gnosticism, but one a major false teaching was that Jesus was less than God, and so it, it led many to deny the humanity of Jesus. And there's a, a heresy also taught that there was a higher knowledge above Scripture and above the teaching of Jesus, and that people still needed to be enlightened spiritually, even if they were saved by Jesus. These false teachers, they wanted these Christians, they wanted others in the city to believe that Jesus was good, but Jesus wasn't enough. They were teaching that to know and follow Jesus was not sufficient. They were telling these new Christians, you need something more than Jesus Christ in your life. And Epaphras, the church planner, he was worried. He didn't want to see this new church, these new Christians, these young church be pulled away or led astray. And so we know that he went to Paul as a mentor while he was in prison. And, and Paul writes this letter to, to this church in response to that. As we study Colossians, we're going to see Paul encourage these young Christians in their walk with Christ. But he's going to address and confront false teaching. Man, we're going to see in a, in a few weeks an amazing passage, a Christology passage that tells us who Christ is. And that Jesus is above all, church. Right, we're going to see that Jesus is sufficient, right? That in Jesus you have all you need. And church, this is so important to understand. We are to remain faithful to Jesus, church, and to the teaching of God's word. And here's the, here's the thing. Any teaching or idea that goes against God's word, church, we have to recognize it. We need to call it what it is. We need to stand firm against it and guard against it, church. Right? That's part of my job as the pastor here. That's part of anybody's, anybody's job in here that's, that's a leader, especially if you're a teacher. But it's really all of our responsibility to guard against false teaching. But here's the thing. If you don't know what God's Word says, you can't stand against the false teaching. Right? And so as we go through Colossians, we're going to be taught and encouraged to grow in our walk with Christ, to grow more and more in our understanding and devotion to Jesus. Colossians, it's not a long book. Uh, but it's really good. And so today, I would love for us to zoom in on just the first two verses. And church, my prayer is that we walk out of here today knowing or being reminded of who we are in Christ. I think this is more important than we realize. We're in a political season right now. I don't want to speak in favor of or against politics. But church, we need to know who we are and where our identity is, right? We're not Republicans first. We're not Democrats first. We're not the Green Party first. We're not Independents first. If you know Christ, you are a Christ follower first and foremost, church, right? As Paul is about to teach and encourage them, he begins in his letter by reminding them just in his greeting. He's saying, this is who you are in Christ. This is your identity in Christ. You belong to Jesus, and we already saw Paul introduce himself and, and lets them know the authority behind what he's teaching, right? He said, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, and I'm writing by the will of God. But I love this. Paul also reminds us, he lets this church know that Timothy is there with him. You know, we might just skip over that. But Paul's given us an example that's really important. Timothy is there with him. Epaphras has been with him. Others have been there with him. Paul constantly has people serving with him. It's just a reminder. Paul is exampling for us something important. Church, please hear me. We are not to isolate ourselves. We're not to do life and ministry alone. It doesn't matter how big and powerful you are or small and tiny you are, right? We are not to be isolated. I think it's fair to say if Paul needed community, we need community, right? I, I know we can be tempted, church. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hit it hard here, church. I think we can be tempted. When things get hard, we withdraw, right? When life gets busy, we withdraw. When we're not in a good place, we withdraw, right? And we want to do things on our own. But Paul is reminding us that is not God's design for your life. 
God created you and me to do life in fellowship. By the, word, by the way, the word fellowship doesn't mean potluck. I praise God for potlucks, right? It means partnership. It means sharing, right? God created us to, to have fellowship, to be in community with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Fellowship and togetherness are how God created us and called us to do life and ministry. All right, there's just the introduction. You guys ready to start? All right, look at verse 2. We're going to hang out here for the rest of our time as Paul tells them and reminds us of identity. He's going to tell them about who they are as Christ followers and even what family they belong to. And I want us to really focus on this here because the truth that Paul lays out for us is going to help us as we walk through the entire series. Because knowing who you are and knowing who you belong to changes how you live. It does. And so right away, Paul says, church, before I teach you anything else, you need to be reminded of who you are and who you belong to. Before I get into the teaching and the correction and the instruction, Paul's saying, let's talk about who you are. Look with me to verse 2. He says, to the saints in Christ at Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters. And then he gives that famous greeting that he gives to many churches, grace to you. And peace from God our Father. Paul is introducing them and he's, he's greeting them and he says, this is, this is who you are. And the first thing that he says, we're just going to look at all of them, maybe not in, all, in the right order, but we're going to look through all of them. He says, he begins by saying, you are saints in Christ. We hear the word saint and we might have a different thought going through our mind as to what does that mean. I'm a, I, I can assure you, Right? He's not talking about the New Orleans Saints football team. Right? This is not their life verse, okay? Maybe, I don't know. But you also may have heard another teaching about who a saint is or how one becomes a saint. But church, for us to know what Paul means, what the Bible means when he says saint, I just want to tell you this. We're not going to look at another teaching. We're not going to look at a tradition. We're going to look to God's word. And right here in verse 2, Paul clearly calls these people who are alive and well saints. The word saint or title saint, it means to be set apart or to be holy. To be a saint in Christ is to be set apart by Jesus for Jesus. And remember, Paul is writing this to people, to Christ followers. He's, he's writing to people who have been saved by Jesus. And I just want to say, there is a teaching out here that surrounds us, church, that says you, you need to have died before you can be considered for sainthood. Right? But we just, I'm not trying to hate church, but we just don't see that in the Bible. Right? When we see the word saint used in the Bible, Paul is clearly writing to Christians who are alive and well. And biblically, to be a saint means that we are set apart. Here's what Paul is saying. If you are a Christian, if you've been saved by Jesus, if you've been given a new life in Christ, then you have been set apart. You are a saint. The word saint has, again, has the definition to be set apart or to be holy. And we've talked about this before. The Bible says that if we are Christians, if we're saved by Jesus and belong to him, the Bible says we are to be holy as he is holy. Right? Right? By the way, that in no way means that we are God or holy like God. But to be holy is to be set apart for Him and live our lives for Him, church. So when God calls us to live a holy life, right, He's saying, since you are a child of God, since you are a child or a Christ follower, live a life that proves that. Live a life that is set apart for me. In your, on your bulletin in the back page, your first note is this. Paul is saying that our identity is in Christ, and in Christ we are set apart to live lives no longer for this world, but for the Lord Jesus. Right? We are set apart, church, to live our lives no longer for this world, but for the Lord Jesus. No longer for you, but for the Lord Jesus. No longer for your sports team, but for the Lord Jesus. We are His, He is ours, and we are set apart, church. And so when Paul says they are saint, the Bible uses that word and that title to talk about who we are in Christ. We're saved. We're set apart to live for the Lord Jesus. And so if you're saved, the Bible says you're a saint. And we can know this is true because 
right? The Bible supports itself, right? Context supports itself, right? It, it, it tells us what the meaning of it is. And when we see the word saint in the Bible, it is always used when referring to the church and to Christians. There are so many biblical examples where we see saint in the Bible, too many to look at them all, but we should look at some of them, right? I want us to see just a couple of them. In Acts chapter 9, it tells us that Peter went down to visit the saints who lived in Lydda. And so who are the saints? They were Christ followers who were in this city. Acts 26 talks, talks about saints who were in prison. Who was he talking about? Talking about Christians who were put in jail for following Christ. They're saints that are in prison. Romans 8, Romans 15 talks about saints being Christians. 1 Corinthians 16, right? Paul tells the church of someone who has devoted his life to serve other saints, other Christians. A lot of examples, right? But it's always used to describe Christians and Christ followers and those in the church. And why is that important? Because as we read through Colossians, as we study God's word, it's important to know who you are. And the Bible says if you're a Christian, you're a saint. You are set apart for him. Not that we're better than anyone else. It's not that we earned being a saint. Let's be honest with you, with us, right? If, if we had to earn it, we're, we're kind of in trouble, right? We're saints because Jesus died and rose again, forgave us of our sins, and made us to be His. Because we are His, we are to live lives that are set apart for Christ. That's who you are. If you're a Christ follower, you are a saint to live a life set apart from this world, but for Christ. This is really important for us to hear, church. If you want to to mature and become more and more like Jesus, if you want to live the life Jesus made you to live, then you need to understand who we are. We aren't set apart for worldly things. We're set apart for Christ to pursue and to live the life he's called us. And so first Paul reminds us that we are set apart for Christ. Verse, or verse 2 again, to the saints in, Coloss in, in Christ at Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters. Next thing I want us to see is, is that faithful word. He says these Christians, he says you are faithful. He's implying that that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing, and you should remain faithful, right? Remember, these Christians are surrounded by false teaching, against teaching who is, who's going against who Jesus is. And Paul is encouraging them to remain faithful. Stand strong, church, right? Stand firm in what you know. Stand strong in your walk with Jesus, don't be swayed or persuaded to turn from the truth of God's Word. As we think about our kids going back to school, young people, stand firm in your walk with Christ. Know who Jesus is. Know the truth of God's Word. Don't be swayed or persuaded. When I think about the word faithful, I think about marriage. When we say the word faithful in marriage, we're talking about staying true. Amen, church? Right? Stay true. Right? Be trustworthy in that marriage. Don't be persuaded to leave and go to another person. Right? But remain true and faithful to your spouse. Church, this is who we are as Christians. We are to remain faithful and true to Jesus. When trouble comes, and it will, stand firm in Jesus. When false teaching comes, know the Word of God and stand firm in the Word of God. When temptation comes and opportunities to sin against God come, stand firm in your walk with Jesus. That's who you are. As Christ followers, before Paul teaches them and encourages them, he says, this is who you are. Church, as we walk out these doors, you're going to hear false teaching. Paul says, remain faithful. When you walk out these doors, you're going to face temptation to sin or to live like the world. But Paul says, because you belong to Jesus, remain faithful. If you're in Christ, if you're saved, we're called to live faithfully, church. It doesn't matter where you are, who you are with, or what you're doing. You are always in Christ, and we're to remain faithful and remain true. We're encouraged to be able to stand firm in Christ and His truth. You guys know the song, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Sometimes we're tempted to wonder from walking with Jesus. And sometimes it's when we're around the wrong people, right? Now, let me, let me say this clearly. We're to be around everybody, not just Christians, right? We want to be around those and love people well, but not, not influenced by them to walk away from Jesus, right? 
Sometimes we're, we're tempted to set aside God's truth when we find ourselves in certain circumstances. Or maybe you read the Bible and you're like, I don't really like that, and so I'm going to set it aside and not be faithful. Paul points out to this church, hey, you're faithful. As a church, we need to walk away being reminded that if we're in Christ, we belong to Him. You don't belong to your job. You don't belong to your party. You don't belong to your sports team. We belong to Christ, church. And we're to remain faithful and live faithfully. So we're set apart, right? We're to live faithfully. And then Paul points out that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Your translation may say brethren, right? He says to the saints in Christ at Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters or faithful brethren. Paul's talking about the church family. He's talking about the family of God. Paul is encouraging them in the relationship they have with one another as a church family. We already talked about this as Paul was was already with other Christians, right? He's exampling them that family is important. And by the way, the few times we saw this in Acts when we preached through Acts, when Paul wasn't able to be with other Christians, he struggled, church, right? He 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 was depressed. He really, he was down. He missed them. He was in a bad place because he had no family with him. And Paul is saying, as Christ followers, you are saints, you are set apart for Christ, we're to remain faithful and stand firm in our walk with Christ, and now he's saying part of your identity is that you have a family in Christ. Right? Here at Authentic Life Church, we are family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 that when we're saved, we're adopted into the family of God. Which means you got bros and sisters in Christ. When we're saved, we become children of God, and Jesus brings us into his family. You've got brothers and sisters that you're going to live with for eternity in his family. And Paul is addressing the family in the church here in Colossae. As he's doing that, it's a good time to recognize that we are a family church. We're a family. We've got the big family, the big C, right? Christians all over the world and that we're going to spend eternity with. But we're also a local family right here. I was missing out. My sister and I were missing out. My uh, Part of our family was having a reunion, a family reunion. I'm just kind of living through it through pictures. I love family reunions. Does anybody, like, love family reunions? Okay, that's about what I expected, okay? I love them, right? That's kind of the extended family, but I love being with my family. I love being with y'all, right? Right here at Authentic Life Church. I remember growing up, my parents and or my grandparents would say, hey, you're part of this family, right? You're part of this family. You're a Vanderford. You're a Cash, right? You're, you're part of this family. We're to love one another. We're to forgive one another. We're to be together in this family. We're to live as a family and do things as a family, right, church? Okay, right? Within a family, you have love and support, right? And you encourage one another. And then when you're old enough in your family, you, start, you all of a sudden have responsibilities in that family. Right? I think about, you know, my son sitting over here on the front row, and I just think about, like, his chore list just gets a little bit longer as he gets a little older. Right? You have responsibilities in a family. Are you with me, church? Okay? Maybe some of y'all should learn that. I don't know, right? We have responsibilities in a family. You may be the leader. You may be the nurturer. You may be the one who takes the trash out or cooks the food or pays the bills or cleans your room or up after the dog. And so, right, you have responsibilities. You're also to love one another within the family, which means you encourage, you forgive, you're patient, you protect, you look out for one another, you serve each other. Church, when you look at Scripture, God takes His family seriously. For Him, it's not just a Sunday thing. For us, this family should not just be a Sunday thing. We have a lot of instruction about how we're to love each other in the family. Right? We're going to have differences. Look at the diversity in the room. We're going to have differences, but we're to love each other. Ephesians 4 teaches us how to live and love in God's family. Paul says in, verse, in chapter 4, he says we're to be humble. It's a good one to start with. We're to be gentle with one another. We're to be patient. We're to bear with one another in love. The Greek phrase for that means we're to be stretched out in love for one another. He says we're to make every effort to protect the unity of the family 
1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians chapter 4 teaches us how to serve one another in the family. Church, God loves His family. And Paul is highlighting here that they are brothers and sisters. By the way, I just want to say this. God's design is not for you to love Him and hate His family. Right? It's not to walk with Him and not with His family. Just They go together. If you're saved, you're part of the family. Church, we need each other. Right? And we need each of us to participate in the family. To love each other in the family. To support each other and encourage each other and to help each other grow in the family. I think about my dad, my mom, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles that helped me grow into the man I am today. Right? If you, you got some learning, you right, that you need, grab somebody in the family and say, I need help. Like, I need to grow. I need someone to teach me how to, how to read the Bible. I need someone to teach me how to be a good dad or a good wife or whatever it may be. Are you with me, church? Right? We got responsibilities. And just like your biological family, right? We got reminded of this all the time. When you leave this house, when you go to work or school for the day, you represent this family. Right? You represent this family. When you leave this family gathering today, church, we represent Jesus and we represent Authentic Life Church. It's part of your identity. It's part of who you are. You're part of this family, right? You're part of the family of God and this local family. And so Paul says, man, you are set apart. You're to remain faithful and you are family. And all of that is because, not because of anything you or I have done, but because of Christ. Let's look closely at what Paul says in verse 2 to kind of wrap this up. He says, to the saints in Christ at Colossae. If you are saved, then you, the Bible says, are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is what, church? Okay, class participation, ready? Therefore, if anyone is, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Church, when we trust in Jesus, when we are saved by Jesus, we are in Christ. 2 Corinthians tells us for your notes that when we are in Christ, we are made new and we are given a new identity. Praise God, you are no longer who you used to be. The Bible tells us that before Christ, we are sinners. We are far from God. The Bible says without Jesus, you're enemies of God, right? We are slaves to sin. I'm quite happy to no longer be those things, church. I no longer have to be known as being far from God. I'm no, I am now a loved child of God, church, right? I belong to Jesus, and I now have a family because of Jesus, right? God gives you and me a new life in Christ and a new identity, and I love this. It is now Jesus who defines who I am, church. It's Jesus who defines you, who you are, right? The way I vote does not define me. The place I work does not define me. The school I went to does not define me. The amount of money I have or don't have does not define me. Jesus defines me, church. Your past doesn't have to define you. Jesus can define you, church. I no longer belong to the world. I belong to Jesus. He's where I find my value, my name, and my identity. Praise God, church. Come on. To be in Christ means we are new, we've got a new identity, He defines us. But it also means that I get to be secure in Christ. I love this. As Christians, we are safe and secure in the One who bore our sins and gave His life for us. And when we call on Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, we are once and for all forgiven of our sins. And because Jesus paid the price that we owed, our relationship with God is restored, church. We now have this full assurance. We are sealed until the day of redemption. We are His and we will spend eternity with Him, church. Right? When we are saved, we are now in Christ. And to be in Christ means that we will never be separated from Him. Never separated from His love. Romans 8, 38 says this, For I am convinced, he says, I know, church, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on, church. Right? To be in Christ means we are safe and secure in him and to be joined together in Christ forever. 
Being in Christ is knowing that we will never be separated from him. Guess what? I deserve to be separated from him because of Jesus, we are safe, church. Because of Jesus, because we are in him, we can be called righteous. We can be called sons and daughters of God. We are set apart because of Christ. Church, to be in Christ means that Jesus becomes everything to us. He's not just something added to our week, church. He's everything. Our identity is first and foremost in Christ. You want to be a Republican? Be a Republican. You want to be a Democrat? Be a Democrat. But you are in Christ first, church. I think our world needs to be reminded of that. I think America needs to be reminded of that. You are in Christ. In church, it's Christ who begins to lead how we think and live. I know I'm picking on Republicans, Democrats, and all that other stuff. Now, I like politics. I just want you to know that. I'm sorry. I really do apologize. My first, when I first went to school, right out of high school, was political science. I'm messed up. I need forgiven, church. I'm grateful for Jesus, okay? <laughs> but church, too often, we see the world through the lens of an R or a D, and it's got to stop. Amen. Come on, church. As Christians, we see the lens through the gospel. Through the lens of Jesus. That's how we see the world. Jesus begins to lead how we think and how we live instead of the culture or the world shaping how we think or how we do life. Church, it's Jesus. When we are in Christ, it's He who shapes our ethics and our relationships. How we live with our, how we do life with, with our family. Christ designs that, right? Right? We follow his, how we live, how we, how we love people, how we, everything about who we are, Jesus shapes us, church. If you're saved today, you are in Christ. He belongs to you. You belong to him. We're to see the world and live in this world as Jesus does, not as any other organization tells you to. Our identity is in him and the life he gives us, church. When people see me, I want them to first know that I'm a Christ follower before anything else. Then I want them to see me as a faithful and loving husband and a good dad and amazing. You get what I'm saying, church? Like, that's, that's what I want them to see. I want them to see Jesus in me. If you got neighbors that don't know you belong to Jesus, there's something wrong, church. If you work with people that don't know you belong to Jesus, your priorities are wrong, church. I'm stepping on my toes too, church. Come on, like, we got to get that. When people see us, do they know we belong to Jesus? Our identity is in Him. That's who we are. And as we walk through Colossians, we, we've got to read it through the lens of who we are in Christ. We are His. We are saints set apart in Christ to live faithfully for Christ. We are brothers and sisters. We're family in Christ. Before we close, I want to point out, point out one more thing. Paul purposely makes this statement. He talks about two citizenships, basically. He says, you are in Christ at Colossae. He's saying to these people who live in Colossae, first and foremost, don't forget, you are in Christ. You may be a Colossae citizen, you may be an American citizen, but first, you are a citizen of heaven. As the song says, and I love this song, I am proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. But my identity is first in Jesus, church. Your identity, our identity should be in Jesus. For us, if you're saved, you are in Christ at Tucson, at Vail, right? We are in Christ as we live in Arizona. We are in Christ as we work at our jobs. We are in Christ, and we are always in Christ. No matter where we live, no matter what we do, we are in Christ, church. That is who you are. We represent Jesus, right? We, we belong to and we are with Jesus while we live in this world. And Paul is saying, know who you are. Right? I tell my kids all the time, man, you're a Vanderford. You belong to this family. You represent our family. Know who you are. Know who you represent. You are saved by Jesus. You're a saint set apart for Christ. We're to be faithful in our walk with him. You're to be part of his family, and you have a new identity and a new life in Christ. And so, church, we are in Christ no matter where we live, no matter where we work, or no, no matter where we play. As we close, I want to read this quote. A man named Sam Storms, he's a, a pastor, he's a ministry leader. He says this about being in Christ. It's good. He says this, no matter where you are geographically and physically, what you are spiritually will never change. 
You may be at work, at play, overseas, under the weather, out of money, but you are always and unchangeably in Christ. You may be down in the dumps, over the hill, or beside yourself, but you are always and unchangeably in Christ. You may be at paradise or in prison, at the movies or in Chicago, but you are always and unchangeably in Christ. Your geographical, earthly, physical location has no effect on your spiritual identity. Church, we belong to Jesus. We are in Christ. That is who we represent. Paul is reminding them, he's reminding us of who we are and who we belong to. If you are saved, church, you are safe and secure in Christ. You belong to him and he belongs to you. And so before any other thing identifies you or defines you, our identity is in Jesus, church. No matter where we go or what we do, we are in Christ. We are to live our lives set apart for him, to live faithfully with and for him. And we're to do that, church, together with his family that he's given. Know who you are. Know whose you are. Because that changes how we see the world and live in this world.